I'm Professor Barbara Sahakian, and together with Professor Trevor Robbins, we're going to speak to you today about boosting cognition, creativity, and well being through lifelong learning. And this is to ensure flourishing societies and a better world for future generations. Now, how can we achieve this big goal? Well, we can do this through education and lifelong learning, which are very important for the individual and society, because in a changing world, we have to learn to adapt and we have to learn new skills. And we now know that our brains are still in development right up into late adolescence, early young adulthood. So our brains are developing during the formative years at school and university. Now, Professor Robbins is going to talk about the innovative approaches to learning that can affect the brain, cognition, and creativity. And these visionary approaches to learning can impact on education to help develop future leaders and innovators to create novel ideas and interventions for a better world. And we know a lot about the evidence-based factors that impact positively on cognition and well-being across the lifespan. And this we learned from the UK Government Foresight Project on mental capital and well-being. And education is one of the most important of these. Well, why train structure learning and why is cognitive flexibility important? Well, structure learning leads to brain changes and increased cognitive flexibility, which is a kind of learning to learn. It's this adaptability and, and being able to be flexible about the way that you learn. And that leads in turn to increased creativity. And this supports academic and work skills, as well as problem solving, creativity, and resilience for the individual. So Professor Robbins will now tell us more about structure learning and why cognitive flexibility is so important. Hello, I'm Trevor. So cognitive flexibility, what do we mean? We mean getting rid of rigid ideas and thoughts and actions and coming up with new problem solving solutions to new situations. Technically speaking, psychologists talk about this in terms of a capacity to switch or shift thinking from one conceptual representation in the brain to another, especially in response to changes in instructions and feedback from the environment, but also spontaneously, what we do that's new. So cognitive flexibility, theoretically, has always been thought to be one of the triad of so-called executive functions mediated by the frontal lobes, the frontal cortex of the brain. So in this triad, we have working memory, our ability to remember phone numbers, for example, response inhibition, our abilities to resist temptation or impulse, and cognitive flexibility. Now, it turns out when you do a whole lot of tests of these functions, and look at their interrelationships, cognitive flexibility is rather weakly correlated with IQ, which is interesting, and also with working memory. Although those two, IQ and working memory, are quite highly correlated and also tend to be inherited. Whereas cognitive flexibility is less susceptible to heritable factors and therefore more susceptible to environmental factors, including training and education. And so this forms, in a sense, the basis of this project. Can we train cognitive flexibility and enhance education? So what are the classical tests of cognitive flexibility that we use in the human psychology laboratory? On the top left here, we have the Wisconsin Cardsall test. This is a tried and tested warhorse of cognitive psychologists to test our ability to think flexibly. You're given a pack of cards which vary in three perceptual dimensions, and you can see them here, shapes, colors, and numbers. And then on the basis of feedback from the clinical psychologist, you're supposed to learn a rule for sorting these cards into color, form, or number. 
But having learned that rule, it may then change on the basis of feedback and you have to adapt to that change and show flexibility. Patients with frontal lobe damage tend to perseverate. They tend to be rigid and continue using the old rule, even though they realize things may have changed. You know, in the middle here, we have a modern day version, if you like, of this kind of test. This is a so-called CANTAB test of what we call extra dimensional shifting. It's the same basic idea. We have these visual stimuli on the touch screen, touch sensitive screen. So you just have to touch them rather than sort them. And initially you're trained to distinguish between the shapes to earn reward. And these lines are kind of meaningless and irrelevant, but suddenly the feedback changes and you have to attend to the, to the lines. So this is the same kind of shift as you get in the Wisconsin. Now, the advantage of this test is you can even train monkeys to do this test. And indeed, again, we've shown that manipulations of the frontal lobe tend to impair the, our ability to shift in this paradigm. Now, a rather different type of shifting is shown in this right-hand example, where you have two habits, essentially, in conflict. You have to either respond to the letters in these stimuli, which occurs successively, or to the digits, as you see here. And you're actually instructed when to shift. So you have to shift between these two habits very quickly. We call that executive shifting. And it's kind of central to this clinical test of so-called trail making, where you have to track letters initially and then suddenly switch to digits again um, in trailing uh, this array of stimuli. Now in the middle here, we have a, yet another form of switching in a more volatile environment uh, where things are much less predictable. You have to distinguish between these two stimuli, but you're only rewarded 80% of the time for responding to the green one and 20% of the time for the red one. You're punished on other occasions. So it's all a bit unclear and it makes it harder to know when to shift. So we call this probabilistic reversal. I'll come back to this a bit later. And then all of these tests are related to classical tests of what we call creativity. Um, this is a test of flexibility in a sense where you have to take three words. Here we have wheel, electric and high, or out, dog and cat. And you have to flexibly get rid of the semantic boundaries associated with those words and reassign them to other words. In particular, you have to find the word which matches each of these other words and is used in combination with them. So for example, this is house. So we have outhouse, doghouse, and house cat. So this is an example of convergent creativity, and it's often used, of course, in crosswords. So these are the kind of tests we have in the lab. And they're useful. So in the case of the CANTAB test I showed you earlier, where you have to shift from shapes to lines, over the lifespan from four to 83 years old, you can see these are the, this is the performance in terms of flexibility. So lower scores are better. These are the number of errors you make in making the extra dimensional shift. And you can see intriguingly that we become flexible rather quickly in our pre-teenage years. But maybe we can improve this even further. Um, we reach our optimum, now mid-career mid as it were, and then you can see rigidity creeping in with advancing years, um, which I'm sure many of us are experiencing. So this is a kind of lifespan test. And you can also use the test in the context of brain scans, brain imaging, to find out which circuits are involved in terms of flexibility. So again, the same test, this time given to not only healthy volunteers, but also unfortunate patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, who tend to be rather inflexible. And you can see their performance on this uh, regression here related to brain activity, to the resting state activity of the brain when you lie awake in an fMRI scanner. 
And we find that activity in a frontal region of the brain project into a part of the subcortical brain called the stratum. Activity in that pathway directly correlates with your degree to make this shift. So shifting can be related to brain function here, cognitive flexibility. And, and the question is, can we make this even more efficient than normal? So we come to structure learning, which is a, a, a new theory, a new methodology by which we can train the brain possibly to be more flexible. So how does this work? It's, it's rather revolutionary because it encourages spontaneous flexibility. And it depends on the fact that our brains turn out to be rather remarkable at imposing order on the world. So supposing you're again lying down and you're presented with the stimuli on a screen, one after another, they don't seem to make much sense, but they come in some sequence. And your task is to predict which of these stimuli will occur next. Now, it might seem to be an impossible task. You're not given any feedback. Um, you're just, you know, looking at the stimuli and trying to generate order out of chaos here. But actually, it turns out we're rather good at it. And it trains. So we get better at it with training. And this is the basis of our cognitive training uh, attempt to get subjects to get used to spontaneously showing flexibility. This is often called patterning in the developmental world, um, where the same stimuli are, are given to children and they begin, it seems to make sense of them. And that's already been shown to maybe improve some aspects of their academic performance. So how does structural learning enhance cognitive flexibility? Well, essentially, there's two main tricks. The first is that, of course, these stimuli occur in what we call a Markov series. So they have fixed transition probabilities relative to one another. And you can see the rules here. They're, they're very probabilistic. And so somehow the brain makes sense of these probabilistic rules to generate the next example. This uncertainty generates flexibility. And sometimes there are shifts in these rules. So, you know, they're changed around and this one doesn't always follow this one with the probability of 0.8, it might be different. And so again, being exposed to these um, encourages your brain to show flexibility. And in fact, when one gives subjects these kind of tests in a brain scanner, as you can see here, um, intriguingly, we see subjects show some individual differences in their abilities uh, to perform on this task. They have different styles, actually. So one style is to focus on the dominant stimuli, the ones that have high probabilities. And we call this maximization. And that seems to activate parts of the brain which include the frontal lobes and also part of this subcortical structure we call the stratum, which we met earlier. Other subjects, very intriguingly, show a different strategy, a matching strategy, which is much more akin to flexibility and exploration. They kind of match the probabilities of these transitions. So not only do they attend to the very likely transitions, but also to the least likely ones. And so they show an ability to switch their predictions between high probability and low probability. So this is quite a remarkable uh, finding. Again, without any feedback, without being told whether you're correct or not, the brain can do this with training. So one of the tests of flexibility training is to see whether we can transfer. Transfer is the key to cognitive training. You can train someone in a specific situation but then can they generalize it to other situations? Can they show essentially a learning to learn ability? And here's some of the preliminary evidence we have that that's the case. 
So first of all, in this top left example, structure learning performance before and after training on the same stimuli. You can see there's dramatic improvements in subjects' ability to predict these stimuli. But then we transfer to a new structure with new probabilities, the same stimuli, and you can see almost immediately this transfers to a level much better than was originally observed. So this is one example of what we call near transfer. We can also show this transfer to new content. So in other words, not only can we show transitions within the stimuli trained, the stimulus set here, but to entirely new stimuli. And again, you see this dramatic transfer effect from pre to new. So here we have the two keys, probab probabilistic structures and new content. Now, we can take this a little bit further by taking us away from these stimulus sets and structure learning to more conventional tests that are used by psychologists to assess cognition. And one such test is of decision making, the so-called Iowa decision making task. And this is a complicated task. I'm not going to go into it, but it reflects your ability to learn and to assess uh, probabilities in a, in a situation which might very well relate to the real world, you know, in terms of um, taking risks about investments and so forth. And indeed, structure learning has been shown to correlate with an improvement on this particular decision making task. So here's an example of relatively further transfer away from the original situation to a lab situation which has some connection with the real world. So now we get to the very heart of the click project. And I'm going to show you how these ideas are manifest in three work packages using the key outcome variables that we're interested in. So first of all, I've talked to you about structure learning, what it is and the relationship to so-called patterning in the educational world and how this relates to cognitive flexibility and near transfer, the ability to show how training in structure learning links on to other tests used in the laboratory. Now, tier two would be further transfer. So to this, we're getting to more real life situations. IQ testing, maybe it can be improved by training. Creativity, I've already made that link. Problem solving relating to the real world. Language, obviously the second language problem, especially in Singapore where you, know, you have to learn several languages. So you're constantly having to shift between different languages. So this is a prime example where flexibility is important. Also maths, lateral thinking in maths is important as in problem solving. And indeed in socio-emotional situations, maybe it is important to be flexible in our social um, communication attempts. So this would be really good evidence. The best evidence of all, of course, the very objective evidence is school performance um, and later on job satisfaction, salary, and obviously a sense of well-being. So this is obviously an example of far transfer and a very ambitious long-term project, uh, long-term long -term goal of the CLIC project. Okay, so Work package one will look at these relationships for near transfer to from structure learning to laboratory tests of cognitive flexibility across the whole lifespan, essentially up to 50 years. That's to say from neonates and also pre-teenagers, young adults and middle-aged people also maybe could benefit from training in cognitive flexibility. Work package two will look at the all important modulators or moderators of this, of this transfer. For example, early experience, socio-economic socio um, relationships, 
how do these moderate um, our ability to mediate this transfer from structured learning to near transfer? And work package three, of course, will take into account these vital translational goals uh, to real uh, educational and indeed career and lifelong outcome measures. So in a nutshell, this is what the CLIC project is all about. Translation of structure learning to real world measures of education. But how are we going to do that in practice? Do we need any additional technology on top of this very clever structure learning methodology? I think we're going to use apps because there is a already a very intriguing set of projects which have shown that cognitive training with apps is definitely a feasible strategy. And I think what CLIC will do is use this strategy to take structure learning with apps into the real world. And Barbara Sahakian now is going to give you some examples of this app methodology and finally show you how it works with structure learning in CLIC. Thank you. So you've heard from Professor Robbins how in a changing world, we have to learn to adapt and learn new skills to be successful and enjoy life. So that's very important that we are able to do that. And I'm going to talk about some of the more innovative ways we've been attempting to train people by using games. And everybody plays games on their mobile phones or on iPads and so forth. And so it's a great way to engage people because if their motivation is high, they will learn much faster. So we've taken to game development for training and we use a neurobiological approach to improving learning memory and attention and concentration. And we've made these games a lot of fun. They're all based on neuropsychological and neuroimaging evidence. And we've had to use a collaboration between psychologists, neuroscientists and professional games developer to ensure that the games are really fun, attention grabbing, motivating, easy to understand. And also we've made the games often titrated in difficulty so that they're individualized for everybody. So if you're doing really well, uh, you can move ahead in the game. And if you are having trouble, if it's a bit challenging for you, the level will move down. So it'll be a slightly easier level that you do. So you're always highly motivated to, to play the games. Now I'm gonna talk about a couple of these games. And the first one I'll be describing is Wizard. And Wizard is a fun memory game in which you have to remember magic runes, where they go in a chest. So there's different chests and they each have a different magic rune and you have to remember where that rune goes. And that's how you move ahead in the game. But in the meantime, during the game, you, you're, you're a wizard and you're, there's another wizard and you actually can cast spells with each other and all sorts of things. So it's really fun. Now, while you're playing this game, not only is your memory improving, but actually it activates and strengthens a neural network in the brain, which importantly includes the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a very important area for memory. So I'll now show you what the wizard looks like.
Now, teenagers and children love to play this game, but actually the wizard is great for all ages. And we've actually found uh, that it improves memory in patients who have had stroke or in elderly patients who have mild cognitive impairment. And importantly, with these games, you can have real impact because, because they run on mobile phones or iPads, you can technology transfer them to companies, to industry, and they will put them out there. So for instance, Wizard has been technology transferred to the games company in London called Peak. And so it's been a great success in that way. Now we also have a game that's meant for improving attention and concentration in healthy young adults, because we're finding that they often get distracted and can't complete big jobs. They need to often organize their goals and then stay focused on that goal for a long period of time in order to complete a task. And sometimes they're getting distracted and things are interfering. So this helps improve attention and concentration, the decoder game. And what you can see in this slide is that if you play decoder for eight hours over one month, you can see that there's a great improvement in attention. And this is very different from controls who don't benefit uh, because they're not playing any kind of game. And also people who don't play these neurobiological games. So if you're just playing something like bingo, you also don't benefit. But importantly, motivation stays high through the whole time that they're playing these games. So it's a great way to improve attention and concentration while people are enjoying themselves. In this game, Dakota has also been technology transferred to the games company Peak in London. So I'll just finish by showing you what's been done with structure learning. And this has been done in Professor Zoe Quartzi's lab and the game is called Alien Talk. So I hope you enjoy seeing this. been able to show you that through these novel ways of learning, we can meet the challenges of the future with innovative and creative solutions for all sorts of things, for clean energy, sustainable environments, climate improvement, and healthy living. So Professor Trevor Robbins and I thank you for your attention. And whether you've celebrated New Year's last month or this month, we wish you a very happy 2021. Thank you.